Hello, friends. Welcome to the Proverbs 31 Ministries office. I'm here with two of my teammates and my dearest friends, Dr. Joel Mutamale and Lisa Turkers, and we'd love to officially welcome you to our celebration today of the hidden peace, being out in the world. Joel, I know maybe other people have gotten to congratulate you, but I haven't gotten to say it yet. So congratulations on this book, but also your very first book. You're, right. you're officially a published author. Well, thank How you. does it feel? Surreal. So exciting. <laughs> like, like an exhale, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you absolutely. made it. Congratulations. Thank I'm you, so excited to be here today. Lisa, we wanted to include you just because obviously we know when it comes to writing a book, it takes a village, but also you wrote the forward for this book, which is really exciting. I did. I did. Such an honor. And I told Joel today, this is like role reversal because <laughs> he has been there to support me with so many of my projects, which I'm so grateful for. So today it's such an honor and a joy to be able to celebrate his book release. Thanks, Elise. Exactly. So we're here. All of our staff is here. You can't see them, but we're all here today celebrating Joel and this amazing book. And we just thought that it would be fun today to dive into a couple of questions that we want to ask you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Number one, what makes a book on humility a right now message in 2024? Yeah, I think I need to start with a little bit of vulnerability. Uh, and the vulnerability is this wasn't the mess. Actually, I don't even think I told the both of you guys how the origin story of all this came about. Um, this wasn't the message I wanted to write. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. Um, it was actually the message that I put with a bunch of other messages that I thought, for sure, nobody's going to like this message. This is not the one. So this is going to make the other one sound really good. Um, and then yet, as we went through the whole process, it was this almost group experience where it's like, wait a minute, this is kind of like what my heart longs for. This is kind of the thing that I'm desperate for, to experience peace and experience stability and experience security. And like humility, is that the thing that actually could provide this for us? Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I don't remember the last time somebody was just running around with the flag of humility. Like, this is the thing that I'm going to champion today. Um, and yet, the scriptures consistently through Genesis chapter 1 and 2, all the way through the book of Revelation, point out the power of humility. Um, I don't know about you, but I think we live in a world that's just so filled with fear. Uh, around every corner, around every turn, we're just wondering, when is the next harmful and hurtful thing going to happen? When is the next thing going to shake my world to a point where I just don't know, like, can I get through this? Can I make it to the other side? And you may even have doubts with God, like, God, why would you allow such bad things to happen to such humble people, such good people? And the good news is that the scriptures actually give us so many of those answers, and they walk through it with us. And so um, I think that's one of the reasons why this is a today message, because there's no end to fear and insecurity and worry about my weakness. Um, and yet there's an answer to it, which is the power of humility. And I love that the promise of the book is peace because peace can seem quite impossible today because there's each new day is going to bring trouble of its own, you know. Um, and Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but if you're in the privacy of your own home, if you have ever felt like each day has its own trouble, just, <laughs> yep. So I'm right there with you, right? Yeah. And it can be really daunting because how do you go out and create a peaceful environment for yourself to live in when there's so many external forces that are doing everything to your life except bring peace to it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I love that Joel has pointed out this crucial pathway. And it's not just a pathway of bowing low, which is often what we think about when we think of humility. We may even think of it as being in a position of weakness, but it's not a position of weakness. It's actually a position of great strength, mm -hmm. and it is the only way that we can absolutely have peace in a moment, no matter what the chaos is around. The Lord has instructed us. He wants us on our face before him. That is the safest place of peace when we're on our face before him. There's two pathways to get there. We can walk the pathway of humiliation and mm. trip and fall there, or we can walk the pathway of humility. The only difference is one chooses to bow low while the other trips and falls there. Mm. But we both wind up on our face before the Lord, and that is the safest place of peace when we're that 
humbled and and just surrendered to the Lord. And yeah. surrender is a big part of humility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that I found that was just so fascinating was that, and this was in the research process, like you think about going to humility and all these other passages, and, and we get there like with Philippians 2, 8 and 9, but Lisa, one of the things that you've done for me is you've uh, opened up my eyes to the beauty of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and so forever I will be indebted to you for that, but the thing that I found though is just so fascinating of like, okay, what is the payoff of humility that Adam and Eve, this is fascinating y'all, in Genesis 1 and 2, were actually in a true posture of humility, like, think about this. They were in a place of vulnerability. They were dependent on God. They still had to eat, right? Like, all of the tree was good for them to eat. Just this one. Don't eat of this one. Which has to, like, make you wonder, did they get hungry in Eden? Well, probably because they had to eat, right? So this is actually the evidence of weakness. And yet, there's dependence because God actually gave them everything that they needed. Um, I did an interesting study on the word vulnerability. It comes from a Latin noun and a verb, which means to be wounded. And the fascinating thing about Adam and Eve is that in the Garden of Eden, they were in the perfect posture, perfect position of humility, where they didn't have to be wounded by anything outside. But the one place that they could be wounded was from within. Mm -hmm. And so they wounded themselves in that. And yet, it's this place of humility that's in Genesis 1 and 2 that God actually wants to invite us to go back to. And so what is it that happens when we experience this peace that comes from humility? It's actually a regaining of our true humanity. Mm -hmm. Like, we get to return to that Edenic vision, to that place where we're dependent on God, that we can embrace our limitations because we know that God is limitless in what he offers to us. And that is the place where we actually experience true, lasting peace that is not condi uh, conditioned on the hard and harmful things that happen, but actually walks us through all of that. And in the process, we actually become more our true humanity. I love that so much, Joel, and I am really convinced that this world and me and probably a lot of you watching, we need this message right now mm -hmm. because there's such a shortage of peace, and I had never made the connection before between humility and peace, so thank you. That's so good. I love hearing the background of how you traveled to write this book. <laughs> It sounds like it is a life message for you, but like Lisa said, it's also a right now message for us. And so this next question is a little bit more practical now that we've got the biblical foundation for humility. In the book, you talk about how humility is a gift. So how have you seen the gift of humility help you in your relationships, marriage, or even parenting? Yeah. Um, if you want to know about marriage and parenting, my wife and my kids are right there. We could bring them up, and they would give you a master class on uh, They on might humility. humble you right they, here, not right might. here and right they now. They have been. They have <laughs> been. It is, uh, I think in Greek, it's like the perfect tense. It's an action that started and continues to happen, um, but that's just, you know, I'm a nerd. Uh, here, here's what I found about um, humility that has been so powerful for me um, is that the opposite of humility, as we would know, is pride, Right? What does pride do to us? Pride promises the presence of clarity, but only delivers on confusion and chaos. And so all along the way, pride's like, you can see clear, you can be more beautiful, like you can experience all the things that your heart longs for. But in so doing, it actually takes your large vision and it zeroes it down on what I kind of refer to the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. And so a very practical thing, that humility does for us, is it actually gives us the gift of self-awareness. It actually opens our eyes back up. And so you might be wondering, like, Joel, what is humility? I've kind of talked about humility as a three-part movement. Humility is first and foremost knowing God. Uh, there's this famous quote, uh, humility isn't thinking less of ourselves, it's thinking of ourselves less often. Just so you guys know, that is historically attributed to C.S. Lewis, incredibly dangerous to disagree with C.S. Lewis, just letting you know. So I'm not going to disagree with him, but I'm going to suggest maybe that's not the place that we start with humility. Actually, I think it starts with God. We start with an awareness of who God is, because if we can know who God is, then we can know who we rightly are. We're children of God, made in his likeness and in his image. And y'all, if we know who God is, and now we know who we are, we're properly equipped to rightly relate to other people. The product of this type of understanding and self-awareness will produce peace. 
peace in our lives and peace in the relationships that we're in. And along the way, you get to see the beauty of the horizon that's in front of you that pride is actually trying to rob you of. And so I would say self-awareness is a massive takeaway for it. Yeah, I think pride diminishes the best of who we are. Mm -hmm. Even though I think sometimes it, it would appear that pride is like, oh, I'm going to be puffed up and I'm going to be big and I'm going to be accomplished and, you know, and I'm going to um, beat everyone else because I'm going to show, like, I'm great, you know. But it really does diminish the best of who we are because the best of who we are is when we look most like God, our yes. Father, and we are demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. So when I think of humility, I think humility born out of biblical wisdom. I'm not talking about like a false kind of humility, you know, that is just shrinking back. Mm -hmm. But I think biblically wise humility is really demonstrating the best of who we are because humility and the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, mm -hmm. patience, it all goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes, you know, we, we, it's good to ask ourselves, do I want a diminished reality of who I am? Then let my pride respond mm -hmm. in this situation. Or do I want a best of who I am? Then respond in humility. Yeah, so yeah good. that's so good. I'm glad that you pointed out what we kind of sometimes think pride is because I was in a meeting the other day and we were talking about your book and we were just talking about not always pride doesn't always present itself as this like overconfident person like I think for me pride presents itself in my love for control that's mm. where pride comes in for me it doesn't always look like the loudest person in the room or maybe the person that looks like they're the most self-promotional or whatever like it can look like control but even my love for control is keeping me from being the best version of myself like you're talking about and I think the ultimate display of pride is when we want to tell God what really should happen in a situation like this. Which is like textbook control. So <laughs> yeah, like all mask day, every in day. prayer requests, masked <laughs> in suggestions to God. Great ideas, right? You know, yeah. and then we want to hold God accountable to what we really already have deemed is best. And so I think that's an ultimate demonstration. And you're right, it comes back to control because what we don't trust, we will control. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that's important even about that is just acknowledging that there is an innate desire that we have as humans for self-preservation right? Like, that's what control is. That's what strength is. That's what um, desiring stability is. It's like, I want to, like, I want to make it. I want to, I want to uh, persevere through this. But there's a difference between a God-dependent per, uh, perseverance versus a self-preservation type of perseverance. And the more that we try to manhandle by our own will, you know, there's, we were doing, we had a study day once, Lisa and Leah's over here, uh, and we were looking at the, the image or the metaphor of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, right? Remember that? Yeah. Have y'all ever tried to actually do this? No. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah, it's literally not physically possible. Right. To pull yourself up by the boots. Did you guys try this? No, but we looked it up. It's yeah. ergonomically. Oh, okay. It's ergonomically. I was about to say, I'm sad I missed that one. Psychologically, <laughs> neurologically, and spiritualogically. That's a made up word. But a we, spiritual. We really should have put on boots. We should have. I didn't have any that would fit you, though. So. No, that's not. I don't think I even own a pair of boots. I'll have to borrow Michael's uh, boots for that. But I think, think about like, this is the gift of humility. Mm -hmm. The gift of humility is like, wait a minute, there are boots, and there are boot straps, and if I try to pull myself up by my own boot straps, this is maddening. Like, this is chaos making. Mm -hmm. and, and what pride does to us is it sets us into a spiral that will eventually spiral us out of control. And the whole while, we're like, I can do it, I can do it. I can. And you're like, no, you can't do it, but there's really good news. You didn't have to do it, because Jesus did it. Like, Jesus in the incarnation, Philippians 2, 8 through 9, that he took on humanity because, y'all, if Jesus wasn't fully human and fully God, the incarnation would have been rigged. The whole thing would have been rigged. Mm -hmm. But he actually humbled himself truly by taking on humil humility. And then the payoff is he was exalted. There's a therefore in the text that says, therefore, in light of his humility, he was exalted and seated at the right hand of the Father. And by the way, Ephesians chapter 2 and 3, where do we sit when we give our lives to Jesus? We sit at the right hand of the Father. What is the pathway to this type of exaltation? It's the beauty of humility. That's what like leads us through this journey. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, a little bit ago, you mentioned this word self-awareness. 
And my next question has potential to be a little, a little spicy, maybe ruffle some feathers, okay? Wow. So as, wow. we, as we get in the pages of The Hidden Peace and we're on this journey to learning about the gift of humility, what do we do when we're, we're mid-reading this book and we are interacting with someone who thinks that they're humble, but their actions and words reveal that they're lacking self-awareness in this area? How do we have a humble reaction to others who may be lacking in humility? I can give you a real life example. Here's a story. Let's, I'll let you guys determine who the humble one was in the story and who was lacking awareness. Uh, my wife, Britt, and I, we were going on a trip. Very rare for us. We've got four little kids. Very rare for us to actually do a trip, just the two of us. And so we're going on this trip. And I travel quite a bit. And so I've got TSA pre-check on my, on my deal. And why are you all laughing? I don't know why Because I know already. where this is going. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. This is just a very real story. I don't even know the story, but I know who the humble one was already. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> let me just tell my story. So we're going on this trip, and, like, here's the thing. Like, every time we travel as a family, almost always, like, the whole family's thing tra goes with the, PS the TSA pre-check, right? And we all go. It's a, just a beautiful situation. And in this situation, um, mine had the glorious TSA pre-check sign, and Brits, for some reason, did not have it. So we're walking, right? And she's like trying to help me this whole time. Like, hey, babe, just so you know, mind. And I'm like, it's okay, come on. We got to go. We got to get through the line. Like, I have a, a destination in mind, right? And we get there, and the lady at the TSA pre-check line looks at me, and she goes, you know, and I'm like, absolutely, I know. And I show her, and she's like, all right, you can go through. And then Britt shows the car, and then she goes, mm, -mm you got to go to general. And I look back, and I'm like, oh, you don't have TSA pre-check? And she goes, I've been trying to tell you. I don't have TSA pre-check. I look at her, and I say, I guess I'll see you on the other side then. Oh, you said see you at the gate. <laughs> oh, no. No, he didn't, because then she said, no, I won't see you at the gate. <laughs> so I'm, y'all, I, I feel like I am being incredibly humble. Like, I, I am so unaware of the situation. I'm like, oh, yeah, like, you know, like, I'll just go through. Like, it feels very practical and very pragmatic. And you can go through your deal, and then we're going to get to the place. On the, and, and here's what Britt did for me. And it's, you know, it flexes every now and then for different people, but this was mine. She looked at me, and I swear she was looking into my soul. And after about, you know, this many 15 years of, of marriage and being together, I knew I had made a, a very serious error in my <laughs> life. And so she said, excuse me? Mm -hmm. To which I said, we both will go through the general screening, won't we? And she said, yes, we will. And we stood in silence. And you know that line was long. That line was so long. And it was so long, but every step that I took, I was aware of my pride. Mm. I was aware of my arrogance. I was aware, I became more aware. And at the end of it, we had a hard conversation, but it was a good conversation. And here was the invitation. You see, what Britt did for me was she didn't shame me into it. I actually felt the guilt of it in just environmentally in the situation already. And then she just had patience with me to kind of walk through it. And I learned something really important. For me, the goal of that trip was to get to the destination. Mm -hmm. For my wife, the goal of the trip was the relationship in between the destination. And so when you're dealing with somebody that is lacking this, part of it, our tendency is like, how do we show them? How, do, how can we prove to them that they're being prideful and they don't have any humility? And, um, and often what it is is actually being patient and pausing and allowing that environment to prick the conscious, to allow the Holy Spirit to start to do some work. And then if that doesn't work, because sometimes it doesn't work, it starts with some questions like, hey, how do you, like, how do you think that might have made me feel? Like, you know, and, and walk them through that process and determine their willingness to, in humility, work through it or their decision to be unable to see it. And y'all, we cannot force people into seeing something that they are not willing to see themselves. And that's where I have a whole chapter on humble boundaries in the book where humility without boundaries actually creates a concrete heart. And God does not want a concrete heart for us. Humility with boundaries, though, it actually creates a soft heart that stays firm in decision-making and in boundaries, but keeps it relationally positive. And I think, too, especially, like, I'm thinking of that situation, and the beautiful thing about that everyday story is I think everyone can relate to being Brittany, but also can relate to being you, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because I have enough selfishness inside of me where I... 
I was like, yeah, I'll meet you on the other side, even though I'm scolding you. But I'm thinking, you know what? But, but for a little more self-awareness, I could do that same exact thing, maybe just played out in a different scenario. So I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing that story. But love is supposed to be seeking one another's highest good. And if we have that mentality, that is walking in humility inside of a relationship that, again, will equate to more peace in the relationship. Yeah. I think a lot of us have a lot of anxiety, and I'm not going to put this on you. I'm saying I can have a lot of anxiety, and sometimes I have legitimate reasons because there really is something to be afraid of. But sometimes it's because I get so in my head about the way things should be, the way something should be, the way a scenario should be between two people, that it gives this enormous amount of energy inside of me, this feeling of anxiety. To me, it really is energy that just doesn't have a place to go. Mm. And so when I think about the peace that humility gives us, it, it would drive me to say, I know what to do with my anxiety before I get frustrated with another person or get frustrated in the TSA line or get frustrated because I'm going to have to wait in that other long line. It gives it me a long, place. I, I, I understand, honey. Yeah. You made that point for yeah. sure. We yeah. honor you for but going like through general said, security. But like every <laughs> step you took was an opportunity to work on your pride. And I think sometimes the anxiety inside of me, it's because someone else isn't doing what I think they should do. But the real issue is that I'm not seeking the other person's highest good. Yes. And so I really do think that so many of these things that we feel, oh, that's unfair. I have TSA or, you know, oh, like I just want to get through so I can go get a coffee, which I know is your real motivation in that situation, right? I mean, maybe there was a Starbucks yes. that's waiting on the opposite side. Of and the surely table. you were going to get Brittany a coffee. So yeah, you were I rushing. caramel macchiato. Yeah, you were rushing through so you could get her a coffee, surely. Surely. But believing in each other's highest good <laughs> or seeking each other's highest right. good. But I do think that sometimes if we feel anxiety, maybe we need to ask ourselves, what is really stealing my peace right now? And many times I've found it's because I'm demonstrating a lack of humility. Yeah. That's good. The everyday example that you get uh, gave of the airport, which we're not putting you on blast, like we all have our own examples with that. Do you, so what I'm wondering is, with this humility message, do you feel like humility is ever something that we graduate yeah. from? Like, is this, is this something we pursue our entire lives? Like, what does that look like as we lean into this message, engage, engage with these truths, and then kind of carry on for the rest of our yeah, there's this fascinating passage in Galatians 5, at least you already uh, described it and mentioned it, is the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul uses this agricultural imagery, and it's really fascinating, but it leaves you wondering, like, okay, you've got the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and gentleness, and yet, what is the soil that the fruit is actually planted in? And here's a fascinating thing. Uh, the Greek word for humility is tapianos, and in the Greco-Roman world, the context of the New Testament this word was exclusive, almost overwhelmingly exclusively negative. Like, if you walked into a coffee shop and they said, oh, Shay, you're Tapianas, everybody would stare at you like you had the scarlet letter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They would walk, they would want nothing to do with you. And here's Paul to the church in Ephesus and to the church in Corinth and the church in Galatia. It's like all these letters that he writes, and he says, and take on humility associate with the humble. And then in Philippians 2, 8 through 9, be like Christ who was humble. And so it's like, okay, well, what actually is the soil of the fruit of the Spirit? I've come to the conclusion that humility is actually the soil of the Christian life. And y'all, the Christian life is slow growth. Mm -hmm. We live in a society that wants instant gratification. There's this thing called instant coffee, and it tries to tempt you to believe that it's good. It's not. Nothing good about instant coffee. Like, the Christian life, and, and so we want to, like, go around things. We want to go under things. And Lisa, you and I have talked in great detail about what I believe is the most important preposition throughout the Bible, the preposition through. 
It was necessary for the Israelites to go through the wilderness, to go through the Red Sea, to, um, to go through and into the Promised Land, for Jesus to go through Samaria, for Jesus to go through the cross. The story of Jesus doesn't stop at the cross. It, it goes through so we can get to the ascension. Why is the through necessary? Because in the through process, we're actually regaining our humanity. We're learning dependence on God. We're experiencing the power of his peace in the midst of really hard and harmful things. And so is humility something that we checklist and move on? No, because humility is the soil of the Christian life that we ought to cultivate. Um, I do not have a green thumb. I don't know what the opposite of a green thumb is, but that's what I got. Like, I can't help things live for the life of me. But I got this one curry plant. I'm Indian. Did you all know I'm Indian? I did. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> welcome. I'm Indian, and in Indian food, curry uh, leaves are very important for the base of the curry. My Uncle Calvin, he got me this um, curry plant, and y'all, it has taken the life of me to keep this thing alive. And here's why. Oftentimes, I, I neglect the soil that it's in. And my children have this fascinating way to put toys and all kinds of random stuff into the soil of this curry plant. And here's the thing. Anytime something gets into the soil that compromises the integrity of that soil, it, it, it directly impacts the fruit of what grows from it. And so humility is the soil of the Christian life that we have to consistently go back to and tend to and consider. And in that consideration, um, we want to just be reminded that this is worthy work, uh, and it's producing something good in us and for us. Joel, I think you just said a really, really big statement. And I think, if, if anything, the book is a right-now message because every Christian needs to tend to the soil of their life. Mm -hmm. And I, I know sometimes it might feel like, like, oh, humility, like, yeah, I'll, I'll read that book one day. But I think what you just said should be a driving force for us to all read it today. Mm -hmm. Because not only will it help us be more self-aware of where we're lacking in humility, but you give us the biblical theology to know how to grow in our humility. And I'm just so thankful for that. Yeah, that's so good. I feel like that really segues us into our last question. So what is the danger of not intentionally pursuing humility? I think the danger of a lack of humility um, is actually self-exaltation and self-glorification. You see, you and I were never intended to be absorbers of glory. We're always intended to be reflectors of God's glory. God made us uniquely, perfectly to reflect his glory. But when we try to absorb something that is not ours, it is destructive 100% of the time. And, and here's the thing. I don't think anybody wakes up one day and just says, I'm going to blow up my whole life today. Right? Like, nobody wakes up one day and says, oh, today's the day that I'm just going to destroy my family or hurt my closest friends. or Like, they don't do that. But here's what it does look like. It's small compromises in decisions that turn into long-term character compromises in their life. And so not cultivating the soil of humility, not having the family of God around you that cares about you in your heart um, and your sanctification, growing the likeness and image of Jesus, these things will leave you on an island by yourself where you will begin to drink your own Kool-Aid. You will, you will believe your own hype. And that is a dangerous place to be because in that place, there's no room for God and his glory. And we have to always remember that we are citizens of a kingdom. We are not kings in the kingdom. We are citizens. And there's a king who sits on the throne. And that king who sits on the throne invites us to be his royal children. But we are children, and he is the father. I think that's so important. I, you know, I said it before, and I'll say it again. I really do think pride is a quick path to a diminished life. And humility is the beautiful, slow walk of growing more and more like Christ and having your world expanded because the joy of the Lord can be your strength. And also because when we're living out the fruit of the Spirit, people are attracted to us. Mm -hmm. People are not attracted to pride, mm -hmm. but good people attract good people. And so I want to be a person that has the expanded life. I want to live life to the fullest. And the only way to do that is my continued pursuit. And I say continued pursuit 
because I have not perfected this mm -hmm. at all. None of us have. Right. And that's another thing that I really appreciate in your book, Joel. You are very honest about your own struggle with this, your own wrestling with this. And that's why I think you were the perfect person to write this book because you write it with the appropriate angst and at the same time, the solid theological wisdom that we all need.